The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Shimmering skyscrapers, modest homes, inspiring and uninspiring public places. Architecture shapes the space we occupy. All week we'll learn how with architects. Eladia Smoke, Geishigaba Week. Carol Phillips. Marianne McKenna and Don Schmidt. Tonight, controversial buildings. That's next on the Agenda in the Summer. Yesterday, I kind of um, hinted at the fact that the Eiffel Tower it was once controversial. We're gonna get to that in just a moment. But I wanted to get from all of you your viewpoints on this. What would you say is the biggest challenge facing your industry right now? Elidia, I'll start with you. I've been working with uh, Nascape Nation of Kawawa Chicken Match, and they have approximately eight weeks within, to build, within which to build anything, and they have to Tr uh, transport by train all of their materials up from Montreal. So they use prefabricated light wood framing panels uh, that they put together using local crews, all local crews um, from the region because that's uh, the most cost efficient way of doing it. So they have, they experience a whole lot of economic leakage uh, to economies that aren't their own. Mm -hmm. We did a community housing plan over the last couple of years with them and uh, what came out of that through asking questions and listening is that what they really need is a panelization plant right there in their community. Now, uh, this is not generally a fundable element from uh, the federal government who generally assists First Nations in their undertakings. Uh, so it's a real challenge to address issues of economic leakage when it comes to the materials that you use to actually create architecture especially in remote Canada, which is the vast majority of Canada, as mm -hmm. you know. So this is not such a problem in the more densely populated regions of Canada, mm -hmm. but it affects us all because when we think about the architecture uh, of the everyday, it's using homogenous materials that are globally available. Usually, uh, we as can Canadians supply the raw resources. Oftentimes, those go th south of the border for processing, and then we purchase them back. <laughs> and so, That doesn't make sense. <laughs> it doesn't. And it's not really a sustainable way of building in the long run. And so we really have to look at ways, I think, as a nation, of reconsolidating um, our architectural endeavors so that local economies benefit. So I think this is so important. And I'm so inspired by an Escapi Nation that they're actually moving forward with that initiative. Carol, what would you say are the challenges your industry is facing? Well, I think that um, some of it has to do with the, an idea about how we just change culture in general in terms of how we work, how we procure uh, work. Uh, so we're inherently competitive, uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 and the RFPs, the, re the mm -hmm. proposal calls that we have. Um, That's the RFP. Yes, yeah. request for proposals is, 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 the, is the method with which mm -hmm. we uh, procure work for public agencies usually. Mm -hmm. And it's inherently competitive, and it, it leads to, uh, in my mind, um, a lack of knowledge sharing and mm -hmm. collaboration between and among uh, architects, engineers. Um, when with the climate emergency, we're not going to get there working in silos. We really have to share knowledge, share our innovation, and, and I think that this is something that I think uh, is not only on us as architects and designers to actually initiate that, but for for agencies such as public agencies like um, Enercan and other agencies to help to share that knowledge, to help to per proliferate the innovation so that we can all benefit and move along together. And so I think I think we just need to do a, come together as a community and also uh, look at how our buildings can really, really serve and share as much knowledge as possible. And so that's a bit of a challenge uh, for us mm -hmm. is to understand how we can continuously learn from each other and create that community. And Don, what do you think? Well, I, I really agree with the points that Carol has been making. You know, when you think buildings consume more than half um, the energy and carbon resources in, in North America, and of course we 
overconsume in North America mm. far more than our share of of uh, resources. So it's it's an enormous impact that we make as architects on the environment. And the kind of challenge is transforming our, our methods of practice to be far more environmentally uh, respectful. And, and I think to, but the good news is that I think, as Carol points out, we're really learning uh, radically new and, and, and quickly, at a radical speed, I should say, ways of collaborating together. Mm. Marianne. So I'll bring I'll bring the cost factor into it. Um, mm -hmm. I think we, you know, building costs have risen dramatically, and I think just as we're experiencing it as as consumers, the cost of construction has risen dramatically. And and frankly, construction was relatively cheap, or inexpensive relative to European and and some other cultures. I think the challenge will be is to maintain quality in construction. So. We don't just let it go down to the lowest common denominator and build with the cheapest, most available materials. We need a reinvestment into our material, our materials and our and our labor force and how we're training people to actually build quality, durability, uh, regenerative, you know, buildings that will last and can be reused, can be retooled, re, re uh, program mm -hmm. over hundreds of years, which is what we see with uh, projects. You know, some of the greatest projects are actually being able to add to existing heritage buildings and add new buildings to them. So I think it comes back um, for people to understand we need to make an investment because um, if you think about the ability of in Ontario to build with brick, you know, we have a variety of materials, but looking at buildings over a hundred years, what are the buildings that still look the best? Mm -hmm. That can soil very gracefully, can actually develop a patina, it is brick. And yet brick has gone way off the charts in, ter in terms of the way it is fabricated using fossil fuels. So we're in the process of talking to brick manufacturers and asking them to reconsider to go electric because everything will go electric as we develop uh, electric uh, sources of um, energy that are based on electric power. So, you know, it, it's a kind of vicious circle, but I think we need to break that circle of the way we do things and think about durability, longevity, uh, quality of materials, sustainability, and how those materials tie into life cycle. You mentioned resources. Um, I don't have to tell any of you that there is a housing crisis in this province mm -hmm. and also across the country. Is this something that you all think about? Absolutely. Because, you know, it feels like, well, land is at a premium right now. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, and I think that um, I think that this is tied to this notion of investment too, because I think that we can't let one crisis in a way contribute to another crisis. And there has been some conversation about how uh, current green standards are driving the cost of construction up and therefore it's going to impede the speed at which we can address the housing crisis. I, I don't think we can be that short-sighted. Mm -hmm. I think we have to invest in both. We cannot continue to build the way we used to build uh, at the expense of the planet because we are trying to, you know, put out one. It, it, it's just that sort of whack-a-mole thing. Mm. We're just, we're not going to be addressing the, everything holistically. And so um, the, the, the housing crisis is, is, is real. We have the largest mass migration in human history into urban centers globally. That is happening now and that's what we are experiencing. And so we cannot take that influx of people into urban centers without constructing new housing. And I think the type of housing that we construct has to be addressed. The, the, the sort of tiny condo with the great view has to, we have to think about all of the things we've been talking about. Quality of light, quality of space, quality of social space, and actually creating places that feel good with the kind of materials that we use and maybe it's not just coming down to square footage and what's available to you mm -hmm. and investing in rental housing and investing in affordable housing that this is this actually has to be the way forward and not look at buildings just as commodities and for developers to also think about buildings that they are going to hang on to. And then they'll get really interested in energy efficient buildings because if they're if they're hanging on to their buildings, they're gonna want them to to be more efficient. And so I think there should be incentives for developers to actually create more rental housing and to do energy efficient buildings and to really think about the quality of space in all the ways that we've been talking about, mm -hmm. not just 
Also, the commodity. relationship between people. If you have a 400 square foot three bedroom unit, you know, I mean, it's crazy. How do you sustain a relationship? How do you let your children grow up in a in a in a how with do you a make community? How do you make and how do you make community? So yeah. I think yeah. you know we've made the argument to CMHC. You know, they want um, so many units, and we've said, what about heads in beds? Isn't yeah. that isn't that a criteria that you should? So we can do larger units, have more family living in the city, two and three bedroom units, or have people right, right. build. I, I think we're just on, totally on the wrong track. And so it comes back down to that, the first thing we talked about three days ago, uh, values. Mm -hmm. You know, how do architects use their value system and their vision and their value system to actually address these issues? And I think one by one, as a community, and we ask, you know, I mean, we, we have a pretty great community, actually. We're competitors, but we're also peers and respectful peers of each other. How do we actually demand these kinds of changes and say, you know, it's not like, oh, if I don't take this commission, somebody else will. It's actually saying, no, we need to change. You know, yeah. we need the support of other architects to say they they agree and, and make changes to how we are doing housing and confront developers and work out different models. What and it's not a shortage of land. You, you, you let mm. off by saying, you know, we have a housing crisis, it's a shortage of land. It's not a shortage of well, land. Then what is it? It's many, many other aspects in the, the kind of financing, the regulation, the incentives for affordability, the support for affordability. Um, there's, there's a lot of other issues, but there is a ton of land within the urban boundaries mm -hmm. of, for example, the city of Toronto, enormous capacity yes. to build upwards of a million units. I mentioned controversy before. Um, some of the most controversial buildings earn a place in history, and I mentioned the Eiffel Tower. Is there a role for controversy in architecture, Marian? Uh, I, I think there absolutely is, but it has to be, um, you know, I think architects have, have responsibilities. You know, we, we talk about is an architect closer to a, a doctor, the medical profession, where you say do no harm, mm. or are we more mm. like lawyers who will pick up, you know, if I may say, <laughs> almost anything and mm -hmm. defend mm -hmm. a criminal because that is part of their, mm -hmm. that's part of their mandate. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to, you know, we, we have to really feel like we're on the right side of a controversy mm -hmm. by having, and, and I think we have to listen to what our peers say mm -hmm. when you have a community of others that are opposing a project that you may be working on. I think you have to think very seriously what are the values that have driven this, you know, and is this good for our city, our community, our waterfront, you know, are we, are we doing the right thing? Because I think we are more like the, at this table, I think we are more like the Hippocratic mm -hmm. Oath, do no harm. Mm -hmm. Well, Carol and the lady, I wanted to get your views on it as well. Is it about pushing the bar of design or is it something else? Carol? Um, for me, I think that I totally agree with what you were saying, Marianne, about, about being on the right side of a controversy. Um, and, and sometimes you, you, you can't, um, you can't just uh, accept uh, the the opposition as um, as uh, as saying, well, every 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 opposition is going to um, every project's going to have an opposition, or someone's not going to have a, not in my neighborhood, or or, or something right. like that. And, mm -hmm. and and so you really have to dig deep and understand what it is you're doing. Uh, some of the projects that I've been involved in, and and I I, I recall that a project that is. An incredible project for the University of Toronto, a, a multi-faith center that was the first project I worked on uh, at MTA. Um, that was mired in controversy because, as a university, they said we have no business creating a religious building. But what that building was doing was actually creating an, a multi-faith center so that everybody who was not of the Judeo-Christian uh, tradition would have a place where they felt universally welcomed. And so you had to sort of stand by that. And we had an incredible client, an incredible team uh, of people who said, this has value. This has value because people didn't leave their faith at the gates of the university when they came. Mm -hmm. And we had to give them dignified ways of celebrating and convening together and learning from each other. And I think you said it in, in glorious otherness, like mm -hmm. to be aware of each other. And you had to sort of stand by that and understand that what you were, you were on the right side. Mm -hmm. And then the controversy went away quite quickly. But, but I remember that in retrospect, looking at that building now that is like 15 years on, um, 17 years on, um, 
why would that have been a controversial thing? Mm -hmm. The transformation in our attitudes, I think, was, mm -hmm. was really important to know when you were on the right side of a controversy. And Elaine? I've been trying to think through your question because it's a really important mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. uh, Architects are very contra controversy averse <laughs> because we move in fairly political spheres um, with uh, with people who have power, and uh, and the way that we present ourselves can also depend on whether we get future commissions. So it has an impact on our livelihood. Mm -hmm. So we're very controversy averse. But I will say that I got into architecture because we have about 150 years of catch up to do in integrating indigenous perspectives into design. And I think it's a really important endeavor because Canadians need it. Um, I'll use an example uh, of the indigenous people space across from parliament. So that was a gift um, of a disused 30 year vacant uh, former American embassy to indigenous peoples of Canada. Uh, Algonquin nation was not named in the gift. That's their territory. They, uh, Ottawa sits on unceded Algonquin territory. There's never been a treaty in place to legally recognize inhabitation uh, by anyone other than Algonquin Nation on that territory. So uh, there was controversy uh, associated with that endeavor. So myself, David Fortin, and Wanda Dalla Costa, and our advising elder, Winnie Petawanaquat, came together to tackle this really <laughs> difficult question of how do you re-inhabit a space that's highly colonial. It's a Beaux-Arts structure that we talked about that, a very hier hierarchical, extremely divorced from its site. Um, you have to use stairs to get up. There's one tiny little door on the wrong side for us, which is on the east, and, and the door is actually on the north. Um, and uh, and so we we created this almost protest archite architectural concept, and we kind of knew it wasn't ever going to get built that way. But we thought it was important to express things. So if you want to take a look at it, uh, Assembly of First Nations hosts our design and the whole explanation of what it is uh, in three languages: <laughs> English, French and Anishinaabemowin on their site. Check it out. It's, uh, I found it a really experience, uh, a really amazing experience to be part of. And what Winnie Pitawanaquat said is, you guys are overthinking this. <laughs> you need to make a place where our grandmothers are proud to come there. And they immediately say, that's our place. Mm -hmm. And so I think you have to tell the truth. Um, you know, we were gifted this building. Yeah, maybe it was a really controversial gift. Yeah, maybe there were some flaws in how it was gifted. Yeah, but like, there's a good intention there. She's like, right. honor the gift. Mm -hmm. What do we do with a gift to honor it? We wrap it in a blanket. We we wrap it in, in good things. And so she's like, this is reality, you know? Mm -hmm. Deal with it in a good way. And what's come out of that is uh, the team that uh, two wrote, Brian Porter and Matt, Matt Hickey, are part of this team who are rethinking block two, which is that whole block including indigenous pe people space. Mm -hmm. uh, we had reclaimed, kind of just sort of also taken <laughs> this vacant lot that's right across from parliament as a place for, you know, indigenous activity, a sacred fire, uh, you know, dance circle, um, a place where we can demonstrate our traditional architectures. It wasn't really part of the gift, but we just sort of like it. Was <laughs> so uh, Brian Porter and Two Row Architects negotiated um, with uh, their team, and that space is going to be available to Indigenous people's space mm -hmm. as a place to actually sit directly on the land mm -hmm. and a new entrance from the east to that space. So you know what? Something good came out of it. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, It's a beautiful scheme and it's a wonderful way that architecture can speak to challenges and you know big challenges so yeah. I think it's a very beautiful yeah. you know response yeah Don, Not predictable you knew I was coming to this <laughs> because you've met controversy yep. and yep. Uh, most recently for the development Ontario of the spa place. yeah at Ontario place um, the Toronto Society of Architects yep. made a public statement in the spring um, as an architect, what is it like being at the center of something the architectural community feels so passionately about? It's a very, very important question. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, I think one, to kind of a point Marianne made a minute ago, when you're getting engaged in a project like Ontario Place, you, have, you need to think very hard about what's important and how do you make a great park for the 21st century? What are the key values? and and do you commit yourself to be involved? So the controversy has been huge, but we are completely on the right side of this, I'm, I'm convinced. Um, 
Ontario Place has been an extraordinary jewel in the crown of the city for a long time from its inception. You know, it was a place in the lake which post uh, Expo 67, it was a moment for Ontarians to kind of gather and celebrate and be excited about the future. Um, 70 acres of land was landfilled into, it was of new land was created in the lake. And Eb Zeidler and Michael Huff, the landscape mm -hmm. architect, there was an extraordinary um, uh, work was done on, and it was a jewel for 20, 30 years. But, you know, it, it deteriorated and it closed in 2012. And then there was a public panel put together and the panel consulted, um, you know, several thousand people. There were uh, dozens of meetings, 30, 50 meetings with community groups. You know, there's a, a report that's online that is the, the results of the panel. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were members of the Daniels faculty of architecture on the panel. The former mayor, John Tory, led the panel before he was mayor. And they came up with 18 recommendations. And those recommendations are really define the vision for the future of Ontario Place. And then the first implementation was to build in 2017 the Great Trillium Park on the east side of the island, seven and a half acres, spectacularly beautiful park, um, West 8 with the landscape architects. Then 2019, the province said, okay, we'll go out uh, for proposals and 34 proposals were received from around the world. And we partnered with a group uh, who are based in Vienna um, and uh, they are an extraordinary group. Um, but they're not Ontarian. Yeah. No, because we've been talking about... They're not Ontarians. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll say why uh, I, I mentioned that. We were there in May and there's an area of 850 trees on that spot that are meant to be taken away. They're not 850 trees on that spot. Okay, but what's the idea? Because you said you're on the right side of it. So how can, can you explain to people why oh, you're on the right is, side you know, of this? I, I don't know, I don't think you should justify the project. I should I'm not trying it. to justify the project. Because there's, there's so many challenges associated with with the privatization of public land it's with a 95 year well it, it it is you know so i think maybe better would be to answer the question about how do you feel about being rather than trying to justify that this is the right project i think the half of the world or maybe even more half of the city yes. feels like it's not the right thing to do but you're you know caught in a kind of controversy where um, we're not caught in a controversy well, the, you, the, why are you why is it why why is it the question that i asked is you said you were on the right side of this uh, we're why talking about values. So I just wanted to know why you said that. So the question is, how do you make a great park mm -hmm. in the 21st century? If you pose what makes a great park, 70 acres of Ontario Place, 60 acres, a park, a new park, that's one and a half times the size of Trinity Bellwoods Park. It will be the largest park in the downtown, number one. Number two, the the um, the wellness environment, and it's not a spa; it's a wellness environment that is very large. Um, it's about 10% of the area of Ontario Place, and the and the idea is that Ontario Place has has. Um, water's edge and park space for six months of the year. But for six months of the year, it's cold and windy. And if you look at um, the kind of population of the city, is it reasonable that there should be a kind of large public space that is a kind of biophilic environment that's invested with culture and health and wellness I have, over, I think, that, over that period of time. I so, think people will uh, debate that because uh, the people we spoke to, some of them said that they use the space year around and what's happening is going to not be, it won't be accessible to everybody. But I just want to get like a person. It's entirely accessible <laughs> to everybody. <laughs> okay, we, can do, we will debate that another day, but I just wanted to, to, to get <laughs> from feet. like, since you're here, hours, what's hours. it like to be stuck yeah. in um, in the middle of this I'm, potential debate? You know, I'm, in, I'm very interested in debate. I think it's a very important debate to have. I'm totally positive being stuck in the middle of the debate. I think there's a ton of misinformation um, and it's frustrating, but I, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, change our view that we're doing a very important thing that I am totally sure when it's done, it will be an important public space in the city. And it's certainly 
the kind of uh, 60 acres uh, is, what, will be extraordinary. What about just like the lease, something like taking public land and privatizing it with a lease for 95 years when you know that spa or that building won't last that long? So they're, they're kind of conditions. Why will that building not last? that long? Well, maybe it will become a casino, you know. Why would it become a casino? I think you need to, to listen to what people are saying. There's, there's oh, the we're diff- listening very carefully. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, you know, this one, no. but I, but I yeah. think, well, I don't think we're on the wrong side of it, frankly. And, and I think that um, the issue of someone saying, well, it's not sustainable or, you know, birds will fly into the glass or it will fail and it will become a casino. There's no basis for any of those um, of those propositions, um, and to say it's privatization, I mean, is it the, not commercial privatization? Yeah. It's not commercial privatization. It is. So one of the, if you read the report that defined the vision for the project in 2012, it very clearly stated that there should be a year-round, um, publicly accessible facility that could be used 12 months of the year. It's clearly set out as one of the ambitions of the project, um, that it should be sustainable, it should be environmentally effective, that it should be minimum lead platinum or better, which it will be, that it should be, um, so it's In 2012. The, the, the kind of the project and its private sector component is part of the vision that was defined by the community. Oh, Don, that's a big stretch. It's that not a stretch. Big Read the. I, I commend you to download I, the, I, the. Well, Don, you mentioned that it is yes. accessible, but um, in May, part of the uh, space was closed off to people in the city, and people don't have access to that. But we to have re- run and out that's of time. in order to restore the heritage, which a lot of people have said. But if there's pushback from people, do you not think that maybe you should have more consultation? Yeah. Uh, there's been a lot of consultation. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear what it has been, but but anyway, I mean, there has yeah. been. Okay, well, thank you for being a good sport and okay. talking to us sure. about it. Um, I, I think I that could be a meeting. whole week <laughs> of discussions. Sure, sure. Um, it could be a series. That, yeah, but, no, absolutely, that would be a whole series. A whole series, yeah. but thank you so much for your insights and thank you for being a good sport. In the interest of transparency, we just want to disclose that Mark Lawson, the VP of Communications at Therme, is a member of the TVO board. Uh, tomorrow, in our final discussion, we're going to talk about uh, what is great architecture, so something to pick up from there. Thanks so much. Good. Our guests all this week are... Eladia Smoke Geishigaba Week, Principal Architect of Smoke Architecture. Carol Phillips, Design Leader and Partner at Moriyama Tashima Architects. Marianne McKenna, Founding Partner of KPMV Architects. And Don Schmidt, Principal of Diamond Schmidt Architects. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.